Hey guys, Nick here. Just heads up, there's some mature language in this episode. Wanted to give you a fair warning. All right, let's get to it. Hey, welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And I'm Reed. Yes. And we are three industrial designers living in the big city, sweating the small stuff. Yeah. I sweat the big stuff, too. <laughs> <laughs> How's it going, Reed? It's been a while. It's good. It's it's a nice day outside. And I thrive in winter more than summer. Okay. Is that that Viking blood? Yeah, I mean, that costume's going to follow me around for the rest of my life. <laughs> I think that's something that is... I've been called Viking Reed by students before. I'm like, I'm not sure if this is a good thing or a bad thing, but I'll take it. As long as you don't pillage their studios. No, there's no pillaging. Just okay. That was pretty insane. I mean, that took you, what, three months to bank? How, how long? Twelve months. Twelve months to make that Viking costume for Halloween? Yeah. yeah the chain mail alone, how long did that take? Nine months, I think. It was f- about, I think, 40,000 rings and about 40 pounds of metal total. It was a lot of fun, but it was literally every single ring had to be bent at least once. Some had to be bent twice. Yeah. So you had to bend them all into a circle, put four together, bend one open, link them, so you had five, and then you would link all the five ones together. It's a very monotonous process, but it's it's like male knitting is the way I put it. Not that you can't <laughs> knit if you're a guy too, but like I have never done knitting, so that was yeah. my, that was my like, That's put funny. on to Netflix and chill. Okay. Did you ever weigh the costume? Uh, I ballparked it and i think with everything the whole costume was like 60 pounds something like that and would you, is that like is that true to what the vikings how much their equipment would have weighed not do you think? exactly like so i went full out and i was like i want to be king of the vikings <laughs> so like a regular viking wouldn't have the leather armor and the chain mail and the big fancy helmet if you had leather armor, that was fancy enough. But then mm. if you were wealthy, you had chain mail. But if you were super wealthy, you would have all of it. Uh, so I went yeah. as like, I'm going to be the king of all these Viking people and do everything. So that's <laughs> so it, And that's also someone who's sitting on horseback, not actually fighting. So you'd never want to wear that in real life. You'd yeah. just be so slow. You'd get stabbed and like, crap, all that armor did nothing. <laughs> what was the best reaction that you got to the costume? Uh, there's this guy in the subway who thought he was being so sneaky trying to take a photo of me because I went out several <laughs> times in it and he was in my face. I was like, you know, I can see you. And he looked at me like he was so shocked that <laughs> like he was the invisible man. And all of a sudden he found out he wasn't invisible. And I was like, you can just ask me and take a photo. <laughs> right. And then he was so weird. He just walked away. That was that was pretty funny. But it's so funny to me because in New York, you see weird like weird things all the time even not on halloween <laughs> that like somebody in a viking costume i might see them during the week and be like huh i guess they're in a broadway show or something <laughs> it's a new restaurant in town. yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah mutton chops. mutton chops i went to a client meeting at a samurai themed restaurant once that was a thing oh yeah wait yeah the ninja restaurant yeah oh yeah oh yeah ninja not samurai sorry <laughs> I'm only in, I only know my Norse and like Viking history. Other cultures I'm working on. I got more books to read. I'm right. still working on it. So what's been going on with you, Reed? We've it's been a while since we had you on the pod. Um, things are good. Just teaching at Parsons. Just got back from a workshop today where we did a demo on marker rendering for a bunch of students who were nice enough to come out on a Saturday. And then other than that, been busy with work at R. Leiden and trying to find time to do other things that are fun. I'm actually trying to figure out what to do with my life right now. I spent so much time with that costume. Like, there's this giant void that needs to be filled with a new project. Oh. So do I'm you have to any out. thoughts? Uh, my first thought was another costume, but my girlfriend very quickly and I decided that I probably should lay off that for a while. <laughs> uh, so I don't know. I, the Viking thing started because I got really into leather making and bags a few years ago. So mm-hmm. I had all the tools. And I was just looking around. I was like, yeah, I can do this. I can figure this out. So now I think I might actually go back to making bags again. Also because my backpack is slowly falling apart. So Ooh, I just want to okay. make a new one. That would be fun. Mm-hmm. That'd be cool. Yeah. Did did doing that teach you anything about design? Did doing that whole project? Oh, yeah. Extreme patience. That I've, <laughs> I feel like I've always had a decently high level of patience. That's why I do those crazy, like, overly in-depth marker renders and things. But doing that, part of the reason I did it, which is actually part of the topic for today, is I kind of felt like Instagram and social media was giving me a very short 
attention span. I wanted instant gratification all the time. Mm. So I wanted to do a project where it was going to take me a very long <laughs> amount of time and I had to stick to it. Yeah. And I've been getting not as great at this, but a lot of times if I start something, I really get down on myself and make myself finish it. Mm -hmm. So that was one where I just threw all the money into it. The costume itself was at least $5,000. Spent a lot of money on that wow. costume. Okay. That's why, guys, if you do freelance, make sure you put half of it to retirement and half of it to fun things. That's what I do. <laughs> half of it goes into an IRA somewhere, and the other half, oh, I buy Viking shit. That's okay. like what I do. Okay. Interesting. That's great. It, yeah, I really like that aspect that you just decided to sit down and finish it. Because there are so many projects that I start that I'm like, oh, I forgot about that thing. I started like <laughs> a year ago and never finished. Well, you used to have like the notes up on the wall yeah. about what you need to do. My to-do list used to be up on the oh, wall. Oh, well, I guess, I guess your studio is not in your bedroom anymore. Right, I've moved. So yeah. the to-do list is at the studio. Yeah. It's still the same. Still, still the same from a year ago. But <laughs> Yeah. But uh, I guess you touched on it a little bit, Reed. But one of the reasons that we, we brought you back in is actually a conversation that we had a couple weeks ago because... Uh, I, you know, I deal with my own issues when it comes to like anxiety around design and, you know, unfortunately Instagram. And there are moments where I'm like, what, what is the best way for me to deal with this? What is the healthiest way for me to do that? And you had recommended meditation, which I started doing. Um, I downloaded the Headspace app and went through the whole, it took me a while to get through the whole introduction mm -hmm. stuff. And I'm still not quite as consistent as I'd like to be, but it is incredible to me what five minutes of just like breathing and meditating will do to just change the course of my entire day. And so, I mean, Reed, how, how did you get into meditation? Yeah, I mean, I think this is a topic I've been curious about for a while. It's just to be fully honest, <clears throat> I'm just a, I used to be way more tightly wound than I am now. I've definitely realized you need to take a chill pill on that a little bit and just that's kind of a funny way. I didn't literally mean a chill pill. <laughs> <laughs> but like actually just relaxing a little bit and not having such high expectations for yourself. And I got to a point where I was just so stressed out with making myself want to do Instagram and teaching and doing a great job at work and then freelance projects to like where my hands would shake and I couldn't even get them to stop. And I just realized I need to do something about this. This is not... Your, your hands are shaking while you're sketching? Not sketching, but it was more of like there was always like a... If I held my hand out straight, it always like slightly twitch ah. a little bit. That's because mm. I was so stressed. And I realized, A, I was putting that stress on myself. And B, I just wanted to take care of it. So I spoke to one of my best friends and she actually recommended Headspace. We're actually not sponsored by Headspace. We just no. happen to like it. Right. Is, so if you want to use it, I encourage it. But... We're not getting any kickbacks from this. We're yeah. not, I, I listened to all your podcasts before I came. We didn't plug it. so. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I started doing that about, like I don't know, about a little year and three quarters ago, something about that. Okay. And it was just something that made me really realize how I was kind of connecting large parts of my life into one narrative. And it kind of started stressing things out where you and your feelings and thoughts are not necessarily the same thing, which sounds crazy when you talk to people. But I think the real realization for me early on was kind of you can separate how you feel and how your emotions are from yourself. That way, when you have that distance, you can actually look at it and approach it in a more healthy way, opposed to letting it just consume you. It's kind of if you're angry, you can let anger consume you or you can put anger over there and see it for what it is when you have this clear mental space in your head. And then you can decide how much you want to engage with it. And I think that's a very similar thing for design with stress or creativity or anxiety or any of those things that can happen when you're under the deadline for a project or if you are afraid of speaking in front of people or if you don't want to get criticism on your work. So this is something that I found was very helpful for me just as a person, but then I really realized it was actually very helpful for just my design career as a whole as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I... I remember back in school, like, uh, you know, dealing with my own bits of anxiety around work. I mean, the difference that I always seem to see between the way that you and I handled it, which which I perceived as different, was anxiety or, you know, whatever it was motivated you to like to just want to get get down to work. And for me, I, it kind of like would paralyze me mm -hmm. and I wouldn't work as much as I would like to up until like, and then there's that point of the deadline where it's like, okay, all of these feelings <laughs> just have to be set aside. 
and that's 2 a.m. the night before, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, you know, maybe you can maybe you can speak to like you know back in school, like how these things manifested themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that I wanted to talk about today, just because obviously a lot of people who listen to this are probably students, yeah. and I really wish that someone had just sat me down as a student and kind of made me realize that I didn't have to. I didn't have to feel that way and I didn't have to make it affect my work. And it's something that I feel like I've kind of held on to now where one of my like, we're talking about one thing I want to talk about today was like vulnerability. And one of the things I feel most vulnerable about is whether I am creative enough. And I know technically I have lots of skills. I can show the things I need in a high level. But when it comes down to like emotional intelligence and showing things in a creative way that make people feel something, That's the part that I always get a little bit of like James and I have talked about a lot of the imposter syndrome of like, oh, man, Mm. someone's going to eventually realize that I don't know what this means. Well, yeah, but Reed, I mean, you've done amazing designs. You've done like the bar tap thing and a lot of OXO products. Mm -hmm. And you feel that or, or was this a feeling in school that you had? It was definitely more in school. I've gotten, okay. I think I had an epiphany at Smart Design one day where I was getting super stressed about something. Okay. And then I sat there and went, wait, they pay me to be here. Right. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, yeah, I guess they actually trust me. So maybe I should trust myself a little bit. Yeah. But it's one of those things where you just kind of need to, I don't know, see it. And then once you see it, it's easier to address how you actually want to handle it. And then once you know what your personality type is like, then you can address projects in a way that's healthy for you. Like with meditation, if I feel myself getting kind of stressed out at work, there's a bunch of really quick breathing exercises you can do. And I'll just do those where there's one where you take a big, like it's called a belly breath and then a chest breath, I guess. And then you exhale and you do it for a few cycles and it just floods your brain with extra oxygen. So it kind of makes you feel like a little bit euphoric. Mm-hmm. And it's the best. I love it because I you, what you really have to do is you do it for six minutes. And then when you're done, just take a pillow and like scream your face off into it at home. <laughs> and I love that. I do it once a week because yeah. it honestly, it's like I always use the analogy of a pot. And I feel like a lot of times it's like boiling. And when I get stressed, when it feels it's going to bubble over. And then all of a sudden, once in a while, it'll pour over. And that's when actually I get to the place you were saying of like, you feel like you're I don't know, paralyzed from doing something. Yeah. But doing stuff like that at work, if you're feeling a little stressed or take a little walk or something, all of a sudden can reset you and then right. you can come back and do great work again. Isn't that kind of the frustrating part about work? I've thought about this, like, at least for me, like there are things that I feel like I could do during the workday that would alleviate stress for me, but it would be totally weird to do around my coworkers. <laughs> mm-hmm. And so I like, and th- that, then that thought is in my head and it's just like piling on to, you know, like working at home, I can be like dancing around my <laughs> apartment and then like go over and start sketching or do meditation in the middle of the day. Like, mm. th- you know, it's, it's on my terms so I can do what I need to do to like produce the work, you well, know? Well, I've also noticed James that you like to go get coffee. During work. Oh yeah. Little coffee breaks. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I just... I just love coffee in general. <laughs> Just get out of the office, take a quick walk. Yeah. The ironic thing about coffee, though, is it's the most accepted way to get out of the office. Yeah. But if you're an anxious person, it's the worst thing for you to do all right. day. So to like, drink coffee because now you're even more jittery. Or? We have an espresso machine in the office, and I got to a point where I was doing two. I was doing three double espressos, and I was like, "This is not healthy. Yeah. We yeah. need to stop doing this." Were you like just like, "Oh man, I would if I took three double shot espressos, I would just be like." It would be over the day. Yeah, not not at one. It's not six, and you're just like pounding them back. Yeah, I I do I do one coffee in the morning. I do like a cappuccino in the morning, and then like a you know, a cappuccino or latte in the afternoon. Although, I, according to the Italians, you're only supposed to drink milk in the morning. This is what I found That's out. That's probably good. Just yeah. plain milk? Then you're not farting Well, no, afternoon. no. Just like you're not supposed to have cappuccino-type drinks or any milk-type coffee drinks in the afternoon. They only save those for the morning. Oh. They only they do espressos mm-hmm. in the afternoon. I, I watched this with my own eyes in Italy as like... Italian people would come into cafes and they would just stand up at the counter and drink their espresso and mm-hmm. then leave. We we make much more of a ritual out of it. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Hmm. But uh, but yeah, I I I've had that thought too of like, is this just like mounting? Especially in school, I used to drink a lot more coffee, and it's like, is this is this really good for me? Like in terms of yeah, those anxiety levels. No, it's funny. I never had a sip of coffee during college. I just didn't drink it. I just 
I wanted to work so hard that it's like forced myself to get out of bed. And it's only when I've gotten older, I'm like, nah, I need that coffee when I wake up <laughs> in the morning. And I had an old coworker who's like, hey, how do you get energy in the morning? I was like, oh, I just, I love orange juice. And they laughed at me in my face. They're like, you drink orange juice? I'm like, yeah, that's sugar and it gives me energy. Like, you don't drink coffee? <laughs> and then the next day I started drinking espresso. Uh, okay. <laughs> because when I worked at Smart Design. You got peer pressured into coffee drinking? Well, it actually started slowly. Where when I worked at Smart Design, they had a super nice professional, like La Marzocca or some really fancy Italian machine. And we would make like cafe level lattes mm, at the office with wow. latte art and everything. Oh, nice. And when we did that, I didn't want the coffee. I just wanted to make the latte art. So right. I just got good at making latte art and I would give it to people in the office. And then eventually I was like, what's this hype about? And yeah. then it's been five years or six years and now it can't go back. It's too well, It's too interesting far. to me. I remember, so, you know, you saying like, it's the, the way, it's an excuse to get out of the office. It used to be that people went out to go do cigarette breaks. Mm-hmm. And I knew a guy in college who was an architecture student and he, he said, he wanted to quit smoking, but going out and smoking was when he had his best ideas. Like, because when mm. you're smoking a cigarette outside, all you can pretty much do is just like contemplate. And it's in in a way, it's almost like it's almost like a, a, I mean, on one hand, it's a not necessarily the best thing that you could do for your health. But it is like a break during the day to just clear everything away and yeah. like just you know, right. ponder. Right. I think people need to give themselves a little more <clears throat> flexibility in the workday where everyone feels like I'm here and if I leave, everyone's going to see that I'm gone. Right. I can tell you, at least from my experience, I have no idea if you're at your desk and if you're not, I'm not thinking, where is James? <laughs> Why is Nick not at his desk? He must be out doing nothing. Was well, it- it's one of those like mind games too because you are always thinking that people are watching you and, and judging you. But if you ask someone like what, clothes did you wear yesterday they would have no clue no like i've been wearing the same pants for the past three months and no one's noticed i mean i've noticed oh no my nose (laughs) notices i did get i did get green pants this week and my girlfriend looked at me like wow you're looking crazy today and i was like i know this and this wild okay maybe my maybe my uh (laughs) but it's only because it's green i have like seven pairs of black pants so that's okay those no no one notices it's the new york uniform if you wear too many colors people are like what's wrong with this he, guy he's from and then he's you, from la yeah <laughs> i had a seafoam colored shirt and i told my girlfriend that it was my wild shirt and she was like oh you're crazy <laughs> and i was like hey this is big for me this is going off of monochromatic tones it's like yeah. slightly saturated with a different color in there it's good <laughs> so like you know since you've you might have mentioned this already but since you've started meditating how how has that affected your work honestly i've become i I was going to say become and became, but I've become much more at peace with my work, which sounds weird. Where before, mm. I feel like I was perpetually trying to beat it into submission. Like, I was just trying to work so hard that it would come out the way I wanted. And now, it's not so much of me trying to, like, win against my work. It's right. more of just enjoying it. And if I don't enjoy it, that's an emotion. That's fine. If you're stressed about it, that's another emotion. I think something that's been nice is when you start doing meditation a lot more, it makes you realize that the thoughts that you ruminate about or rumination is a big word i never used to know which definitely helps me it's basically when you obsessively swirl and think about thoughts that are negative Mm. and i used to do it all the time just thinking instead of seeing all the good things i had done i would just look at the one or two bad things you've done and when you actually start meditating you can separate those things apart from each other and when you do you finally at least for me start seeing this infinite black space in your mind which is really nice because it feels like you're in a room but the room is doesn't matter anymore it's just you see this huge space and for me it symbolizes infinite ideas in that space Mm. which feels really nice because before i would tell myself oh my gosh i don't have any more ideas what am i going to do i'm never going to think about it in time but now if i get to that space i just think about the infinite blackness in my mind and it that could be seen as depressing or bad but i see it as just there's something in that somewhere. I don't know what it is. Mm. And it's not being clouded by the feelings that I've decided to eventually like pull off myself and sit over there. And then when you're in that space, that's when weird stuff comes into your brain. And it's Mm. actually kind of great. I'm not going to say I've had like huge epiphanies, but there's been little things of just clarity on it. And I feel like going into a project with the right mindset is just as important as going into a project with the answer already, like before you get there. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's interesting. I mean, I kind of feel like one thing that I I realized, and also, first of all, you know, I 
I, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm really grateful and thankful that, you know, maybe I, I don't have as much anxiety or stress as some people. And I know that it's a big thing out there. Um, I'm not exactly sure why I don't, maybe it's genetic thing or how you're raised. I mean, that's a whole conversation itself, but, or maybe I just, I'm, I'm younger, you know, I haven't gotten to that point in my life where I'm right out, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we could just sit here and insult, insult you. Yeah. yeah there we go. There, there we go. <laughs> You'd know already. I've known, I've been this way since I was like yeah. five. It's okay. always been that way. Yeah. The That's same. Interesting. Well, I'm very jealous, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I definitely support you guys. And I definitely think this is a, a great topic to think about. But I also was thinking about when, you know, I, uh, don't get me wrong. I definitely get stressed and I get anxious about projects and deadlines and things like that. I guess for me, I've just kind of saw it or have seen it as like a separate thing, kind of like you're talking about with the, the meditation. Um, so maybe it just comes natural to me. But design is an ambiguous industry. Like the entire concept of design is ambiguous. Right. And I think people get really stressed and anxious, especially at the beginning of a project mm -hmm. and seeing all that ambigu ambiguity of like, oh, I have to design, you know, this toaster. Right. And what does that even mean? Yeah. And, and I know that is a very stressful point right at the beginning. And I've always just kind of step step back and seen that it is supposed to be like that. Like it's supposed to be very ambiguous and it's not something to get stressed about because that's the process. Right. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think in general, like ambiguity in in any part of life can be stressful. And then when you choose ambiguity as a career, like solving for ambiguity. Right. You know, but it, this, um, you know, this point that you brought up about rumination and um, like, I remember in, in school hearing this, this uh, quote that was worry is the misuse of imagination, mm -hmm. which, which, which Whoa. I thought was really interesting. Be, interesting. And actually my, my dad told this quote to me and, and he and I, I think are very similar in the way that we, you know, in our, you know, levels of anxiety or whatever he, um, so like the idea that we are creative people and therefore like we can, not only create things that are interesting and unique, but we can also create sort of like doomsday scenarios as mm -hmm. well. It's like in my head, I can concoct like this whole thing of how this project is going to fall apart and how mm. I'm going to be like the laughing stock of the design world and, you know, lose That's interesting. all of my credibility. You know, like yeah. that is also a part of the creative mind is like that ability. And you think that's okay, though? I think, well, so, like, stress and, and also that in mind, I think, like, there is an appropriate amount of, of like, thinking about that kind of thing and letting it factor into your work because, like, a certain amount of stress is good because it'll motivate you and it'll also, it will also kind of, like, illuminate the thing that you should focus on rather mm. than the things that mm -hmm. are yes. kind of extraneous. <clears throat> right. And then also, like, you know, say you have this feeling of like, oh my gosh, these are all the things that could go wrong. It can also lead you to like have a bulletproof uh, presentation for work that you're doing because you can imagine all these scenarios where oh, somebody right. would argue against your point. Or, or like maybe you just even have like file types for every single file that m might not work on your computer you know you got, the, you got a pdf you got the powerpoint you got the the pages you know whatever yeah it is. that's a good point i don't know hmm. what do you think reed i completely agree i mean i think i was actually gonna say something else too about like this a like, funny quip on the side our professor ed dorso when i was mm. in school he said to me reed you're a great designer but you won't be or you're a good designer but you won't be a great designer until you just accept ambiguity Mm. And I thought I was going to be a mechanical engineer. My whole, I, well, I thought I was going to be an architect because every kid doesn't know what industrial design is. They're like, oh, creative, be an architect. So that's going to do. And then I was like, oh, I'm pretty good at math if I work really hard at it. And I like drawing things. So I'd be an engineer. And then I got to tech and did industrial design. And I just wanted there to be an answer. And everyone just said, what are you talking about? There's no answer. You just, you, you do it. And yeah. I was like, well, what does this mean? <laughs> like, I just want you to tell me what's right and what's wrong. That, that's really interesting too, because when I think back um, uh, on some of the projects I've done, you know, when, you, when you're in school, you think that the project, when you do it and you finish it, that is the final thing. Like you, you designed a chair and that's 
the chair, like it's fully designed, it's the final product. But when I got out into the real world and started designing pet products, I had that mindset, like I'm designing this dog toy and this dog toy is gonna be the final dog toy. But but then I worked there for like two and a half years and realized, oh wait, I'm actually revisiting that dog toy product and making it a little bit better like a year later. And so like products themselves are iterations on top of mm-hmm. each other. You know, like they, there's gonna be a next whatever product. And just cause maybe that that design you're working on is not perfect, that doesn't mean it's bad. It just means that, hey, you made it, you pushed the previous design a little farther, and the next time someone else comes back to that, they're going to push it farther than yours. Yeah. You know, know how people, when they admit that they're an alcoholic, have to say, hi, my name is Reed. Right. <laughs> I say, hi, my name is Reed, I'm a perfectionist. <laughs> or it's basically, I'm a recovering perfectionist, I feel like. Perfectionism is a, a whole, like, another part of the stress and anxiety yeah. problem i think perfectionism yeah. is half the reason i feel like i developed such a bad relationship with stress and anxiety because i put such a high expectation in myself that was literally unattainable mm. and when i didn't hit that i wouldn't i would just be upset and if i hit it i'd be like okay well i gotta do it again and i would let myself only enjoy something for five minutes and mm. then i'd move on to the next thing so it's just something that you need to be okay with but when you all of a sudden realize that things don't have to be perfect then all of a sudden it opens you up to a whole new world. And I feel like it's something that's probably very obvious to some people, but wasn't obvious for me. Yeah. And for me as well, like I, I was definitely, I was probably more perfectionist in school than I am now, but you're right. Like it just, cause it's not perfect. Doesn't mean it's not good. It's also like a, a project, a perfect project that's never finished is way worse than a good project that's finished. Mm-hmm. Just get it done. Yeah. Like, what's that yeah. awful, like, Larry the Cable guy? He's like, get it done. Get her done. Get her done. It's honestly how it is. Like, I, I had that epiphany. I was, obviously, I did my Viking costume, so I'm very into, like, Scandinavian stuff. And just for people to listen, part of that is because my grandma's Danish, and it's the only part of my family where basically we had, like, Danish Christmas growing up. So that's why, that's where the Viking thing started, was basically that. Wait, what is Danish Christmas? Uh, Abel skeevers. I'm probably saying that wrong. Abel skeevers. It's basically like it's a big cast iron pan that has half spheres, and you put pancake mix into it. It makes like spherical pancakes. Mm. And then lingonberry sauce. And my grandma's had all the Royal Copenhagen plates and spherical pancakes. They're really. I'll make you guys some someday. Oh my gosh, it's actually on my Christmas list for whoever hasn't bought me one yet in my family. I want Abel skeever pan, but Ah. so, but we'd always go over to my grandma's house and wait, where was I going with this? I was talking about. Denmark. We're talking about kind of the origins of your your Nordic costume, right? I had a reason. I'll come back to it. I okay. had a whole thing I was going to say with this. <laughs> I hate that when you have like the seven bookmarks in your brain and you're like, all right, one, two, shit. <laughs> what was the next one? It's completely gone. It'll it'll come back. It'll come back. Yeah, I think the I think the other thing, and you know, like I've been doing some like sketch demos recently, and I think that like. I think that learning the hard skills, especially as a student, can can lead to some some tension because like one one of the things that I always reference is like that feeling of like staring down at a white piece of paper and like, you know, just making like like lining up to make that first mark. Mm -hmm. It's almost like lining up to take like a putt, like a birdie putt. And you're like, oh, God, I hope I that's like I hit this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, like there's so many for me getting into the shop was like, I did not grow up being a shop boy Mm. at all. And so that was like to overcome that and feel like I could I could walk into the shop and feel comfortable, like, you know, possibly screwing up. Mm -hmm. Like, I think, well, I can, I will definitely say being stressed and anxious about the shop is a good thing. A good thing. (laughs) Because that router, man, that router is scary. Oh, man. We, I will not name them, but we had one guy in school who his fingers are all the same length now because he did not put (gasps) his fingers on top of the wood when he was using the planer. Oh, no. Uh, And then another guy who went straight through his hand with a chisel. That was. Yeah. So, yeah, the shop, and when I worked at Smart, they had a picture on the side of the bandsaw. It was like basically vectorized so it wasn't like a real picture but of a guy who chopped his finger off at the office so you don't want to you don't want to take the shop lightly. right but i don't you're you're forcing me to take an odd position which is there's worse <laughs> things in the world than getting your finger chopped off well of course like, there are but like but you know that those are the exact kind of thoughts that would keep me from getting into the shop or or at least 
I mean, for me, the anxiety was like, was uh, like going in there and making something that, like stupid, like for n- like not being able to make something. The the critique that I always got in school was like, it doesn't look like your sketch. Mm-hmm. Oh wait, so so when you made the final product, it never turned out as 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 you intended because of your shop skills. It it didn't. Yeah, like it wasn't, it didn't have the kind of like life or mm. energy of the sketch. And, or it did just like, I would, I just didn't know how to translate some of the more like complicated things that I would sketch into. Mm-hmm. I was, I came into I, ID being somebody who sketched all the time growing up. Yeah, that yeah. was like mm-hmm. my crutch. I, I will say also, most objects never have the character of a sketch. No, no, not at all. But there is like, you know, looking back on it, there are, I can look at a model and be like, well, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't even represent the sketch even in the slightest yeah, because my shop skills are so poor. Mm. Um, and I remember, I remember like it was third year of, of studio and we came back and we had to do this, um, we had to do this project where we designed a handheld electronic device Oh yeah, and I remember they they like required a certain amount of models, and I like bought more foam than I needed, and I was like, I'm just gonna go in there and just like, and just do this because like obviously the, this is something that I need to overcome, and I need to not be afraid that like I'm gonna waste material or yes. anything I, like that. I think that is a great tactic, especially for for making things, is always have a backup plan for making your product or your project. I mean, definitely that was stressed at our school. Like the first one you make is going to be bad. So Mm -hmm. that's why you buy like twice the material. And there's also that saying of like measure twice, cut once. Mm -hmm. Totally true. Um, Yeah. I mean, I I remember multiple times doing projects and the first thing I, the first project I would make messed up. Like whether I was learning a new process, like, you know, working with the the milling machine or slip casting or something. I, but I, I had the forethought to be like, oh, I understand that this is my first time doing it. I'm going to mess up. I'm just going to expect that. And so I'm actually going to start like a couple days ahead so that when I do mess up, I have time and I have extra material to uh, continue on. Yeah. I think that goes into this. I think that's a big reason that I want to talk about this is this basically students who are out there you're in that weird spot where you're expected to produce but don't know how to do it yet and you kind of need to learn and like no one is going to really judge you if you mess up as long as you learn something from it and that's something in portfolios i always see is just i always want to see the aha moment of like mm. what did you it could be the biggest failure in the world but as long as you learn something from it and then you actually took that didn't get crushed by it and kept moving forward yeah. that says a lot about your personality yeah yeah it's like well i i remember th- being you know so critical and 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 overworking my portfolio to a certain point where it was it was much more graphic than it was like explanatory Mm -hmm. and i i feel like looking back on it i should have just had like a just like a series of photographs of like here's all the models that i made here's what's like what's bad about them whatever it's like to just show the process in like kind of a roughish form than to like to, to see all these like really overwrought graphics mm-hmm. of like what what this thing is um yeah do you think it do you think it's bad to call out the bad things about your project no no i think well, there's so many students who just hide all of the i'm doing air quotes for you guys you can't see us bad parts and that's the rough stuff up front and actually it makes you look like a worse designer if you just show the final stuff because it makes it look like you had one idea right okay and that's not what you want from a junior designer okay well i i agree um i do want to like just voice an opinion about especially final presentations i remember when i was in school i mean i think it's great to like you know when you go up to the final presentation kind of show your process show you know your phone models what worked what didn't work um and, and everything but I think when you should present your final project to your your you know, potential employer, you need to present it like every everything was like like the toaster. Like if, if I designed a toaster and maybe there was like the toast didn't fit exactly right. But 
it's more of a conceptual thing, right? Like, mm-hmm. I'm not going to go to the employer and be like, hey, I designed this toaster, except the toaster doesn't fit and it oh, doesn't quite well, work like this. Well, that's depends on that's a fixing. different, that's okay. a different I, okay, so that's thing. that's what I just want to clear up. I think that like, is a different thing. You tried some crazy design where the toast goes in horizontally and it was terrible. Like that's yes. a show. Yes. But if it's something that's obvious, like you didn't measure how big toast was, right? That makes you not look great. Right. And and so that's the one thing that I just wanted to clarify is like there are a lot of students that get up there to present their final projects and they're like, yeah, I actually chipped the bottom of it and and shows the whole class like. No one's going to know if you chip the bottom of that. Just be, oh, no, be not, confident and present the final yeah, project. No, you don't want to point out those types of mistakes. Okay. Like you would want to, and and not even, I think that's the other problem is like calling them mistakes. Like I think calling out things that you pursued that, tests. Didn't, that didn't work. They're tests. It's like, like science. Yeah. yeah. It's an erotic thing people do where if there's a problem, they will call it out before you can call them out for it. Right, and that and that's the thing that I don't like because mm-hmm. it seems like you weren't confident in presenting your idea. Like, it's okay to try things and test and fail and use that to build up your story. Yeah, but, but you should be confident in the final product. Exactly how you got like, there. Like even with sketching, I always tell I have a quick demo I do at I did it at Smart and Frog and now Arl Eden and basically talking about sketching for non-sketchers and people who are very not confident or unconfident in sketching will take a line and if it's wrong they'll draw over it a thousand times mm. to try and fix it and yeah. when you do that all i see is that mistake because it's the thickest blackest line on a right. piece of paper opposed to if you had just moved on and kept doing it you probably wouldn't notice that and you could have corrected it somewhere else right and sorry that's my phone. That's okay. Oh, no. <laughs> I don't do podcasts very often, guys. I don't know the... I think your phone was just telling you that you made a really good point. Oh, thank you. He was like, <laughs> is, that, is that a bazinga? Yeah. That's <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think there's there's a certain thing of showing something because you need to and showing something because you're scared someone will find it before you tell them. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. <laughs> No, it's fine. Okay, it's gonna go off again. I'm just letting you guys know. It's all good. We'll we'll just have to make a really good point in time for the for the bazinga. <laughs> you have one minute and thirty six <laughs> seconds left until it goes off again. Yeah. yeah. No. So one thing that I've been kind of thinking about is is how, uh, and maybe you guys can touch on this is how social media kind of plays into that that anxiety and in, in mm. the mental health of designers. And I don't know if that's a. I mean, social media. Why? spread has affected the mental health of everyone um but i don't know how that plays in specific with designers right a lot to say yeah (laughs) that's what we're here here for well i think it starts with when we were at the square one conference hector kept bringing up things about like numbers and people and i was like what is he talking about but then it's you need to take yourself out of your your shoes sometimes and think about the fact that we were all people that got into instagram pretty early on before it was a thing and students now see these people who have huge numbers and huge followings and they think that that is success Mm. when a lot of times there's a lot of people who have big followings but actually do pretty bad work they just have something that's catchy or whatever it Mm. is and people look at that as the metric for what's good and it's actually not the number is something that does i'm not gonna lie and say that's not helpful it's helpful it helps you open avenues that you wouldn't have other times but then the day It's not what's going to get you your first job necessarily. It's not what's going to give you a good portfolio. It's not what's going to make your professors like you and give you a good grade because you did good work. It's just an extra bonus thing. There it goes. (laughs) Bonus things. (laughs) (laughs) It's just basically... I'll go. Thank you. I'm stuck in the corner. It's just basically Instagram is a place that can very quickly become destructive if you base your self-worth off of your Instagram page. Right. Yeah, the thing the thing that I've been trying to stress recently um, is I I have always seen Instagram as the way to further round myself out beyond my portfolio because I feel like my portfolio doesn't tell the whole story. But I'm not posting portfolio work to my Instagram. No, like that's not that's not how. Like I think that there's a bit of uh, like there is a, a part of of Instagram where people are posting like, like portfolio level work just to kind of show like what they're capable of. But I could easily also see that on their Behance. Yeah. For me, it's like, I want an employer to see like, this is the kind of stuff that I enjoy doing outside of, outside of working outside of my professional practice that I'm just like 
that I'm curious about and that I wouldn't put in my actual portfolio. Yeah. But then they get a sense of like who I am even further than than what my portfolio can tell. I, yeah. I I think the there's another issue kind of with specifically the design Instagram community and seeing, you know, people sketch these amazing sketches and almost and you know, obviously we as professional designers know that that's not actually how we sketch mm-hmm. in real life with clients. Um, but you know, there are people in school that possibly may see those sketches and be like, whoa, like that's how I should present every concept in, mm-hmm. in every idea that I ever have. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, you know, not, uh, it's, it's almost a, a daunting task and it, and it probably contributes to the problem, but you know, you, you're allowed to just sketch as, a, a way to kind of record your mm-hmm. thoughts you know yeah. it's like it's a place where you can just doodle down ideas and you know we sketch these awesome fun sketches mainly just for fun like they're almost illustrations yeah. i mean to today extent. i did a demo at parsons before i came here and we did a marker demo and the first thing i always say when i do these demos is this is not the real world of design right this is something that i find fun and that you guys can learn from. And it is useful for you to be here because it's literally the same way I approach digital sketching, just without control Z. But it's the type of thing where people see this stuff and they think it's the reality and it's not the reality. Yeah. It's a part of it, it could be your reality. If you want a funny side note, I actually only did marker rendering sketches once at Frog and it completely blew up in my face because the clients, I spent so much time, it's like beautiful, the renders, not to toot my own horn, they were pretty good and I was okay. very happy with them. Mm-hmm. But the client hated the concepts because they said they felt too retro. And I think it was mostly because of the sketching style. (laughs) Yeah, and the colors. You know, sometimes you sketch something with blue and they're like, And then we give them renders. Like, oh, this is great. I'm like, it's the same thing. It's literally the same thing. But it was the style that played against me. Right. I think there's another aspect to it, which is like, if if you do something, if you push yourself to do something like that type of rendering, like, especially as a student... Like, you're going to get something out of it. It's not like it's a totally, like, wasted practice. It's just not necessarily how you need to present your work. Mm -mm. Like, it'll teach you something, but, you know, like, it'll it'll maybe teach you how much you actually need to convey your idea. Yeah, I mean, I'm always on the boat of trying to stress the concept, the thought, the -hmm. thought process. Like, I'm a big fan of, I want to see how you think. I want to see you come up with really interesting ideas and concepts. And no matter what, no matter how you convey those ideas and sketches, it doesn't really matter. I mean, I think about, you know, the our good friend Chris Ferentz in high school. Like, he's working on his sketching skills, and he's certainly young, and he's got a long ways to go. But it's the idea that really counts, mm-hmm. you know? Yeah. So I teach at Parsons. That's why I was at Parsons today. And a big thing I try and emphasize with my – my class is basically a sketching class, but I got permission from the dean and everyone to basically completely redo my syllabus, and I've done it completely over to make it about communication, not sketching. Mm. Obviously, the class has a lot of sketching in it, right. but there's other things that are brought into it. Like, I remember back in school, there were some students that were started out super strong, but then weren't great sketchers, and then sunk into their head that they were bad designers. Mm. But they weren't bad designers. They just needed to catch up on sketching. But that once that seed is planted of insecurity, it's really hard to keep it from growing. Oh, and man. now a lot of them don't do ID or do user interaction design now and make apps. <laughs> Whole different topic of conversation. <laughs> yeah, but, make more money than us. That depends. Depends, James. <laughs> depends. But basically, something I wanted to make sure was that these students didn't think that because they weren't great at my rendering style or your loose style or your digital style, they were bad designers. So in the class, I always say, here's the basics you have to learn, like the first few weeks. Like James comes in and we do like the form family exercise and everything. But moving forward, like two weeks ago, uh, I had a class where they all had to bring in just basically crap from their garbage like foam core like trash chipboard things styrene if they really felt like it and then said okay you've sketched these process because basically i make them pick a topic and then we develop it all semester so every lesson is about that topic because one of my biggest gripes is i came out of my sketching class with a cool hockey glove done an illustrator and then this and this and this and nothing connected and that's why you see student portfolios with sketching sections and it's like a bunch mm. of random stuff right but they have to connect it all and they came in and they basically had to make quick prototypes of their ideas and i said guys this is sketching this is three-dimensional sketching you're right. really quickly hacking stuff together 
And then I paired that with the two previous classes, where the class before that, I had my friend Dan Fakrzada, who's a film guru at Skillshare, come in and teach them lighting, basics of lighting, um, what's it called, Photoshop, Lightroom, and film, and all these things you can do. And then before that was digital sketching. So I said, now you have this form that before you couldn't have sketched because it was too complicated. You can photograph it, really quickly throw it in a sketchbook pro, draw on top of it. And I was, I've was i never been more proud as a teacher when the next week when everyone came in and their digital renders were 10 times better than two weeks before that because mm. they started mixing media. That's and interesting. someone could have said they were a bad sketcher and never gotten past that. But because we mixed things they were better at, maybe for some students, or at least mixed media, it allowed them to create something which they could hopefully be proud of. I at least was. So, so they took like cardboard and foam and trash or whatever it was built hot glue together some design like Quick. a like i don't know toaster or whatever mm-hmm. and then took a photo and sketched on top of that to make yeah. the concept see that's that's really cool because then you don't have to think about perspective because you're just exactly just, like tracing a photo especially if you're doing like this one student had a really blobby project yeah and of course i taught her how to sit there and break it down and actually like, construct it in three-dimensional space like with, spheres and things yeah like but no, and they, you need to do that to understand it, but conceptually you need to make that leap to just doing it. Right. And this basically bypassed that leap. Uh-huh. And it was just make it in this, draw on it. And then the bigger thing was, I'm super honest, my students were like, I can't draw hands very well, so I'll take a photo of a hand and draw on top of it. So she had her hand and the object and drew it. And it was so much better than just trying to draw from scratch. Right. And then I'm hoping that the realization was, I'm a good designer. I just need to find the right tools for me. Right. Whereas when we were students, a lot of those people would have just gone down a rabbit hole thinking they were crap when they yeah. probably weren't. They're actually really smart. Yeah. Yeah, I think like resourcefulness is is like it's just something that's so so necessary in the in the teaching of design because like yeah, we have we have like tight deadlines and timelines and the quicker that you can put something together it's like it's like a life hack you're hacking things together you know like sort of deal that's literally what design is yeah here's another life hack that i discovered way too late into my college career um go to the dollar store so you know you're making your final model you're you're polishing up your toaster i don't know why i keep going to the toaster i'm just on toast right now but you know you're making a hot topic it's a hot topic (laughs) Um, it's burnt at this point. <laughs> you you go to the dollar store and you pick up some, I don't know, cheap product that is in a packaging that would fit your toaster. So then you take, so, you know, you take the box or whatever that has maybe a, a clear cellophane like window on it and you cover the box with a piece of paper that says, you know, your toaster on it. Mm. Give, give your toaster some fake branding and put your toaster in the box and it looks it looks like you just did an entire packaging packaging product on top wow. of your final project, <laughs> but really you just went to the dollar store and bought a bought a cheap thing. Yeah, I remember when when I went to Quirky after after mm-hmm. you had interned there, um, I I went to them and I was like, listen, I am very like I'm not very confident with shop skills. Like, can can you, can you, this is actually like a good recommendation. I think you might've actually given me this recommendation before going into the internship is like, have something that you want to learn, mm. you know, when you go in there. And so like, they, they had me model out all of the things that they did for the photo shoots where they overlaid the renders on top of, mm-hmm. like they had me do those all throughout my entire time at Quirky. I was just putting together like foam core models. Right. Like I, was so amazed like I had never used the hot glue gun I think my entire time in school like and and just using like hot glue and cardboard like you can make the world I I slept with my hot glue gun it was like right next to my pillow dude zap and kicker made my entire life at smart design you guys ever use that stuff Mm. it's It's like super glue on steroids right super glue but the kicker is some solvent that makes instantly crackle and get super hot and steam but it's like instantly bound like in five seconds it's it's bounded. Mm. Do you ever the, do you ever had the kid that actually got it on his fingers? I've done. Oh I got it, yeah, I got it in I've my done eye. That. I was at. I oh, want to hear a story about people being dumb. I was at Frog, <laughs> and we were trying to paint this. We were making this hydroponic thing for the office, and we were painting it gray because we had a limited budget and we were using PVC. And I couldn't figure out why the like the push button on the spray wouldn't work on the spray can. And 
I was like, it must be clogged. And I was trying to clean it. And as I'm cleaning it, I pushed the thing and it sprayed directly <gasps> into my face and covered both my eyes. Opened my eyes and they were gray. Like my eyes were covered in paint. Oh and God. it was the first time I had to actually stumble and use one of those eye wash things. Mm -hmm. Oh my and God. And the reason it wouldn't work was the safety ring was still in it. <laughs> I didn't know to take it out. Wow. And there's a picture of me. I was in the bathroom with like the office manager helping me literally like pure alcohol my face to get it off of my skin because it was so caked on in my hair. So that's the thing. That's the reason I brought that up was I think the real reason I want to bring these stories up and things is just that I feel like a lot of times when I was a student, I put so much pressure on myself and you need just need to give yourself some slack once in a while. Right. Like you're allowed to fuck up. You're allowed to not know everything, especially if you're a student. And even if you're a designer, like we've all been working for years now and there's still things that give me anxiety or make me stressed out. But over time, you'll eventually look at those things and realize, oh, I actually do have a process and right. things actually do come out pretty well. And that's something that I think everyone has needs some time to come to the conclusion of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think the thing that I freaked out about right before leaving school was this idea that I I didn't know everything that I needed to know to be able to design. Do you know it all now, James? <laughs> no. Well, first and, of all. And, and, and didn't realize that like your first job is extended education. Oh, yeah. You know. And also, let's just be clear. When you're a senior about to graduate, that is also the most stressful and anxiety-inducing yeah. like time. Like I remember, as I got close to graduation, that's when I was like, "Oh no, I have no clue what I'm doing." Yeah, like you know, like junior year, you're like making stuff, all happy and like, "Oh, this is fun" or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then senior year rolls around, you're like, "Oh crap, what in the world?" Yeah. But that's also a good point too of that, you know, that first year out of school working for a company. You're going to learn as much working in that company for one year as you did your entire school career, in my opinion. Yeah. It's crazy how much you learn in your first internships. And that's, I used to have a boss who would always joke saying, can I quit and come back as the intern? Because <laughs> being an intern is great. Like, people don't have crazy expectations for you yet, so you can just learn. Just go right. do things and try it. I always have this, I have this presentation I give on how to get a job out of school, basically, and like the stuff I wish I knew as a student things I've learned since being a professional. And I just wish I was more of a fly on the wall. Just be like, hey, you guys are strategists. I'm not. Can I just like clean up after a meeting and sit in it and listen? Like just learn stuff. People, yeah, right. If you're an intern who wants to learn, people are going to bend over backwards to say yes to you. They're not going to be like, ugh, yeah. who is this person? Your eyes are a lot bigger at that point. You just like <laughs> look like something that they want to hold and, and hug. And... I don't know You haven't gotten that. cynical yet. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Oh, man. Oh, man. But yeah, I mean, I think this is a general topic. Cause like, the reason I wanted to talk about it, I probably said this twice already, it's just knowing that I don't want to like give us more credit than we deserve. But like, if you look up to any one of us or anything in design, it's a type of space where just know that at least James and I have <laughs> neuroses about these things. Well, I, I have stress. I'm just joking. I'm joking. Too, yeah. but, yeah. I, everyone has their thing they right. deal with and everything. And just type of thing where I feel like there's also a weird thing with people just not expressing like concern or emotion. And for me on Instagram recently, I've had some crappy stuff go down recently. And when those things happened, I posted about it in on my Instagram page. And the most useful thing I, or not useful, the most impactful thing I ever got was when people messaged me back saying, I really needed that because I'm feeling really crappy because something that happened to me and yeah. I thought it was just me. Right. But now I'm realizing that it happens to other people. So I think it's just one thing of knowing that like you don't have to be in solidarity in design school or yeah. in professional life or whatever it is. People are probably feeling a lot of the same stuff you are. Yeah. And it's just because we're all humans and we all expect to be perfect superhumans, but that's not the case. That's not what people are. Yeah. And I mean, I, I also want to just say like there are a lot of techniques to dealing with these things and maybe what works for us might not work for you. But like, you know, I've done meditation, I've done therapy, like these, like these things are not, I think especially therapy gets sort of like stigmatized a little bit. Um, and like, you know, I saw a therapist in college. I saw a therapist in the last like two years. Like these are things it, it's almost to me, like, like, you know, what therapy is, is just like being able to talk about these thoughts that are circling in your head. And a lot of times just talking about them and seeing them out in the open is what can sort of like bring them into perspective. Because mm -hmm. there's so often 
that you're just like bottling things up. Yeah. And it's like, you know, uh, it's, it's great to go talk to somebody that who's like impartial to all of that. If you want backup, James, I also see a therapist <laughs> once a week. Yeah. And I didn't for a while, but I saw a therapist in college actually, because I got to a point where I thought I was going to have like a mental breakdown from college. It's like, I was so stressed out about school and this pressure I was putting on myself and I just needed to go talk to somebody about it. So I think that's something that I personally get very like emotional about because my dad died from suicide this year. And that's something I've just realized. It's just thinking about lots of creative people are super sensitive and emotional. And putting design and criticism and your own neuroses on top of that can be really taunting for some people. So you're allowed to let that out and talk about it, people. Like if you want to use social media, I'm not saying you should. It's one way. But that's what I've done. But if you want to go talk to somebody or just just know that other people are probably feeling a lot of the same things you are and you don't have to be embarrassed about it. Yeah. And I think it's what, that's why I wanted to start the topic with just design because, I mean, I get super nervous about things. And I had a review with my boss the other week and he was like, I think you should be a little more creative sometimes. And I thought about it. And I think it's because my neuroses of being seen as, like, I don't know, not the perfect employee made me want to clam up and not ask for help mm. and i realized this is literally the worst way to approach it like i need to just open it up right and then talk to people and then you'll do way better work yeah. so sometimes closing yourself off is actually counterintuitive yeah it, sound, it feels safer but it's not good for the long-term solution right mm. and i think the other the other point to be made is just like any other design project like all of these things these ways of managing this like i have found it, it is as much an iterative process as anything else. And so like you might find that one thing isn't working for you, but that doesn't mean that nothing will ever work for you in terms of like managing these things. And maybe because mm -hmm. like I, I hadn't done meditation ever really before and then like started doing that and was like, wow, this is incredible. This is, you know, this is really working for me. And it's like, if something isn't working, if you're not getting the benefits out of it that you want to be like, all of this is an iterative process. We're all in a marathon here. It's not a sprint. Right. You know? Yeah. That's very true. That's a good point. I think that's something I've, I'm very guilty at is I always want to get the answer right away. Mm. And that's just my own neuroses of wanting to not look incompetent. So I always want the answer so I can, I can get to it and perfect it and get it. Whereas sometimes... Actually, a lot of times that's not the way to go. I'm not an engineer. I'll need something to just like not fail right away. Like you're the design, you're allowed to be the creative voice. And that's something that I think for me has taken a little bit of time to sink in. Mm. And it's something that I still work with today where it's like my initial gut reaction is look at it, solve it, figure it out, move and go <laughs> where that works sometimes, but not all the time. Yeah. No, that's good. But yeah, design should be fun. That's the thing is like, if you're, if you're not having fun with design, really take a step back and look at yourself and how you're approaching it and think about like, what is not working here? Is it how I'm approaching it? Is it about where I'm working, who I'm working with? Is it an environmental thing? Just know from someone who came from a year where like you thought you'd literally never come out of the bottom of a black hole. Mm. When you finally do start coming out of it, you realize that anything is possible all of a sudden because when you're in a spot that you feel really really terrible it doesn't feel like you can leave but then when you do all of a sudden you realize anything's possible like if you can come back from the, whatever the worst thing that's ever happened to you is and that worst thing could be being ridiculed in front of your peers you will come back from that and when you do the phrase what doesn't kill you makes you stronger is actually truth mm. it's not fake yeah. if you keep but the worst thing you can do is have something embarrass you or feel bad and let it control you. That's what you don't want. And in design, getting a bad critique could all of a sudden make you be less likely to speak in front of people again. Or you might not try sketching again because you got critiqued in class. It's mm. the type of thing where the stronger person, actually that's not fair, not the stronger person, but the one who will persevere longer is the one who's willing to jump back on it and try it again. Yeah. Yeah. I think, can I add an amendment to design should be fun? Sure. <laughs> design can be fun. Does, I think I think the way that the way that I try to view it is like design should should be I don't I don't know if I want to say fulfilling but it it should it should be like at the end of a design day like 
maybe there was a lot to overcome and and maybe maybe that design day you didn't accomplish what you you wanted to but at some point like there should be a feeling of of satisfaction maybe mm, yeah i i i think that's a good point to make too i mean i'm always i always try to give a lot of perspective like i i feel like very thankful and grateful that i i get to do design and it's what i enjoy mm-hmm. i mean you think about if i had to do accounting like, <laughs> then design seems you really fun you give them fun. a picture and like what is this like it's a it's a stack of money it's a, there you go. but uh no that's that's a, no i i think that's a good point is that design is difficult and it can be fun sometimes but at the end of the day you should you know you feel accomplished because you're doing your passion yeah it's also funny it's kind of like being a designer is kind of like being in a relationship to a certain degree Mm. where if you go into a relationship expecting everything to be perfect when you find things that aren't you're going to be like upset right Mm. but design is not perfect and you can't expect it to be happy all the time like you're gonna have days where you love design and days you're like what did i do becoming (laughs) a designer this is so miserable yeah but then the day you know that it's a thing that you want to be doing and you're willing to just keep trudging along and some days you're in the trenches and someday you're on like a mountaintop whatever and it's this type of thing where I actually use the same analogy. I could be an accountant and I'm like, crap, I'm just so happy I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's okay if if you had if you had a rough day, like, you know, tomorrow's another day. Oh god, I'm like reaching for platitudes. It's just <laughs> like, you know, it's okay because like this is a part of the process. Like that am- ambiguity and like trying to find that solution, you're iterating, you're iterating like you, and then, but there's oh, like, there's that breakthrough. Like that's, I think feel like that's what we're always reaching for, but it is a process. It's called WD-40 because it took them 40 tries really? to get the formula. Oh, that's not interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway. Well, that was, that was great. I mean, is there any other closing thoughts? I don't know. Probably. I'll think about it tomorrow. <laughs> Maybe kind of late by then. Yeah. Well, thanks, Reed, for coming on. And, of course, you're welcome to come on more. We'd love to have you again. For... Be careful what you say. I'm just going to show up one day. <laughs> <laughs> you don't live that far. You live one point. I took an Uber here. I feel like a piece of shit taking an Uber at one point. Oh, I do it every day. Street. Guys, I, I always walk to your Not house. every day. I don't come over to Nick's every day. I was rushing home. I was a little late. I, was, I already made you guys wait like an hour, so I needed to get over here as fast as possible. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. It's all good. No, it's it's good to continue these conversations and like, because cause you and I have these kind of conversations all the time mm-hmm. about this kind of stuff. And, you know, that's what we're trying to do with this podcast is like, you know, have the conversations that we have, yeah. but have a larger audience. So I have one more thing I would throw in there. Right. It's because I'm a nerd and we started out talking about the show of Vikings. Yeah. But the show, there's this one, the main character's guy named Ragnar. And I, lo- I love the show. Like, I don't care. It's basically shitty filler for Game of Thrones. I'm waiting for Game of Thrones to come back because I watch Vikings. <laughs> okay. Right. And there's this one, the main character, I hope it's a spoiler in case you want to stop, but he, he dies eventually. Mm. And when he does, his son is like, he wasn't like a, a god. He was a man. Like, people mm. are just men or women. They're just people. Right. Yeah. So I feel like the number one thing you should realize from this podcast or social media or whatever, Hector's applauding somewhere. <laughs> basically basically is that these people are not better than other people they just happen to have a few skills that people like and they do what they like and it comes through in their work and these people a lot of times have similar things that they're thinking that they think about that you're also thinking about so it's just be okay with the fact that it doesn't always have to be perfect all the time that's why i say i'm a recovering perfectionist it's where it's like i'm trying to like it, it's like fighting my inner being, but like getting rid of the thought of like, but if I try hard enough, I can perfect life. <laughs> it's like, no, that's not possible, Reed. That's not literally a thing. Yeah. So what what would you say you're most excited about? Like like in the future of, of you, of design? What, what's got you excited? I honestly just like, I, I like the fact, I, I don't want to compare myself to picasso because that's ridiculous but like they say that he got to a point where like he was so good at drawing realistic things that he tried weird stuff right that's what i like i want to do the weird stuff Reed's yeah. going weird like that's <laughs> like that's literally what the viking costume was where i was like this is something that no one here signed up for and they followed me but i'm going to show it to them <laughs> <laughs> every day for every week for a year that's awesome. i was like i don't care it's still kind of design because actually before i got 
out of college, I thought I was going to be, I was considering going into theater design, like set design for a little while. Oh, wow. Because my dad was an agent when he was still alive, and he set me up with these people that did theater sets. And I went for the interview, and they never showed up. I was, like, in a warehouse, and I was like, what? Am I going to get murdered? <laughs> like, what is happening right now? So that didn't happen. But there was a chunk of time where I was like, this would be so much fun to just build theater sets all the time. Yeah. So it was kind of me, like, feeding my, like, kind of very short-lived interest in that world, doing the Viking thing, too. Hmm. Um, but the next thing, whatever that weird thing is, it'll, it won't be a costume, probably. It'll be something else. I'm not a big, I'm not like a cosplay person. I okay. just, I just liked making a costume once. Yeah. You gotta do everything once. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm excited to see what, what's in store for the next, the next project. But we'll see. Maybe yeah. the three of us will do a project. It'll just be fun. Yeah, we that know. would be yeah. cool. We'll, we'll, t- we'll talk off the pod. Yeah. yeah. Anything you want to plug, Reed? Um, not really, honestly. I've been putting some more view- YouTube videos up, but they're okay. I'm figuring it out. I'm learning how to make YouTube videos. <laughs> That's the best part. We all I, are. I love it's that so part much of work. It. Yeah. It's so much work. Everyone's like, give more YouTube videos. It's like, you want to give me an extra 20 hours a week? <laughs> Fine, then I'll make you some YouTube I know. videos. Gosh, Seth Fowler, I have so much respect for you. Oh, man. Um, YouTube, but yeah. YouTube's a, a whole other game. Yeah, it is. But, yeah. Uh, but yeah, again, thank you, Reed, for coming on. And, and you know, this is a great conversation. I hope that it spurs conversation among everyone uh, in the design community yeah agreed Um, and of course you can subscribe on youtube apple Podcasts, google play spotify Spotify now um you know send your questions into minor details podcast at gmail.com we'll hopefully get to another question podcast we've we've been slacking i think we need to do just like a full question podcast i agree i agree you know know what my actual goal for the future is What? what I haven't sent you guys a question yet. Uh, I want to send you a question. I need to think about what it's going to be. A Reed Schlegel question. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> the question to we'll end all questions. Um, <laughs> and uh, our intro and outro is by Kiyoshi the Kid. Mm. And as always, I'm at Nick P. Baker. I'm at I Draw and Receipts. Boop a doop, boop, 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 <laughs> boop a loop, boop a doop. I was trying to do the Kiyoshi the Kid theme song. Dude, well, what's your what's your handle? You're supposed to say your That's handle. my handle. I'm getting weird, guys. Boop a doop. No, yeah, uh, I'm also Reed Schlegel, and thank you guys for having me on. This was great. Yeah. Awesome. All right. All right. Later.